Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another one of our virtual tours of outer space. My name is Josh. I'm part of the Morrison Planetarium team at the California Academy of Sciences, the little logo you got way up there. But we are here to do a very special program, one that normally we would try and do later in the day, around 4.30 in our planetarium. But this is not happening in our planetarium. You can see this is my house. I'm sending to from my house to your home where we are doing a virtual tour of outer space. So Judy and anyone else who has the time, please thank you so much for letting us know where you are tuning in from. It's always fun for me to come back through the comments and see where folks are seeing this presentation from. And for those of you who are watching from other time zones, whatever time it happens to be, we are so thankful for you tuning in. But this is a show that will be recorded if you're watching it on the recording, hello as well. And if this is a show that you think, wow, that looked kind of fun, I bet I could do a better job piloting than Josh, I won't be offended we have a product called Open Space, which is the software I'll be using. And it's one you can download and make this exact same tour happen for yourself. Just check it out. So if you want to check out the openspaceproject.com, that is a great place to go. You can download and you can enjoy this same kind of live flight through the solar system and beyond in a active computer environment. So with that, let's head over to Open Space again. You whoop, the, eh, there, there you go. You can see the window. It's hard with this backwards camera. But we are looking at our own neighbor in space, the moon, and one that actually has a shared history with our own planet Earth. Once upon a time, we think that Earth and the moon were part of the same giant debris field, and we formed and the moon formed from that cloud. Now, when we look at the moon, it can be kind of a tough story to believe. Looking at the moon, often people say it looks nothing like Earth. How could we even begin to suspect that these two things have a shared history? Well, the devil's in the details. The exact reason we think that is because of specimens that have been returned to Earth from the moon. We've gathered up moon rocks, brought them back to Earth, examined them under close inspection, chemically analyzed them, and discovered that the ratios of elements, the specific amounts of specific elements, by comparing them to each other, tells us that the moon has very similar composition to Earth, and given geological principles, the way we say that one rock is related to another is by matching these different ratios. We can say very confidently that earth rock and moon rock have an awful lot in common. We likely formed from the same object. Okay, so when we're talking about this analysis, the understanding of the moon, this was possible because we brought specimens back. You may have heard about the awesome Mars mission that's happening. That's Perseverance. One of the biggest things Perseverance is going to do is bring back little chunks of Mars to Earth and hopefully will teach us a similarly awesome amount about what's going on in the surface of Mars and unveil some of Mars's history and maybe Earth's history too. Last time we checked out the moon and really learned a lot about it, it taught us something about Earth. And I think a lot of geologists would be excited to learn about Mars as well. I saw a great question come in from Dan. If we compare the moon when it rises and the moon when it sets, can we see the advancement in its phase? Yes, you absolutely could. Over that small a window of time, let's say the moon rises and sets, I'm going to guess on the average day, probably around 12 hours, probably not exactly, but close to it. You could see a slightly different amount of illumination on the surface. I'm going to back up because I've just been zooming on the moon's surface because it's so freaking cool looking. But if we were looking at the moon from an Earth perspective, something like this, let's get us aligned to north, because we do so love our boreal centric perspective here on North America. So looking at it from this kind of angle, if we advance time by 12 hours, you might see a slight change. Now, that's not going to be a different phase necessarily. That takes several days for us to really notice those big changes. But for a small change, you might be able to see a specific feature is illuminated or lost illumination over that amount of time. So if you want to check this out, Dan, I would say the coolest way to do it would be to point a telescope or binoculars at the moon and find something that is exactly on the moon's terminator. And what do I mean by that? The line that separates light from dark. Since right now it looks like we are at maybe not a full moon, but pretty close to it, maybe a third, maybe a coming up on full, I would say. The Terminator is going to be way over here on the side. But if we were looking at the moon, I saw it a couple days ago, and we had a beautiful first quarter moon. So I'm going to crank us back a little closer to Valentine's. How about here? Great. Now, if I zoom us in, this is as of February 20th, so just a couple days ago. 
you might be able to see some of these craters where one side is brightly illuminated, the side is completely dark. That's what you want to look for. If you can spot a feature on the moon where it's just partially illuminated, then that will be your telltale sign. And that will change over that few hours of time from the moon rising to the moon setting. Okay, Ursula wants to know, why does the moon keep going around the earth? Or Iris and Ursula, awesome question, because there's nothing to stop it. In space, if something is moving, it has to have something stop it from moving or else it will just keep moving. If it's not moving, then it needs something to push it to get it to start moving. There's a really cool guy named Newton who came up with some of these basic rules about how things should be moving. He came up with them focused around Earth, but they hold true in space too. So if you want to check out Newton's three laws, there are some great videos out there that help explain those ideas, even for four-year-olds. So check out the basics of what we call kinematics, the science of motion. Warrior asked a really cool question. What is the first time we have handled Martian rocks? So actually, we have handled little bits of Mars. I'm going to target Mars because I think somebody wanted to check out some Martian features. But we have handled little bits of Mars. But we were discussing with one of our experts last week. These are not specimens humans decided to scoop up. We did not pick those rocks to bring them back. They're what the universe offered up to us. And I mean by that is once upon a time, long time ago, Imagine some giant asteroid comes slamming into the surface of Mars. When it does that, we have what's called ejecta, little bits of Mars that get blasted up into the air, and they land back on the surface of Mars, except some of them almost certainly got hit hard enough that they reached what's called escape velocity. They shot off the surface of Mars and sort of polluted the rest of the solar system. They're flying around, and once in a while, Earth will bump into these, and they'll actually fall as meteorites. So we have samples of Martian meteorite here on Earth that we've been able to identify and characterize. And again, that ratio of elements, we're able to say this is not a rock from Earth. We're pretty sure it's from Mars. So that's super cool. But this is probably just kind of boring old Mars crust. And if you got boring old Mars crust, that doesn't really differentiate it from anything else. There could be awesome special rocks on Mars that really tell us a ton about the history, but you'd need to carefully select those, not just grab a rock at random. So when we send our spacecraft to Mars, that really is the focus, not to just get a random scoop. Or maybe a lot of random scoops could teach you something, but you really want to make sure that you're getting rock from special sites that really help us understand the context and planet that is Mars. So Janet asked, can we see that giant deep gash on the surface of Mars, I would say absolutely. I saw someone else is asking for the Utopa, Utopia Planitia. I'm not that great at identifying the Great Plains of Mars. So Jessica, if you tune back in, maybe I can look that one up for us. But identifying the big flat areas is a lot more challenging for me than the ones that are dark and interesting looking. So one of my favorite things to spot is right here. It's not an actual feature on the surface of Mars. But this little triangle you might notice, and we'll see if I can point it out with my mouse, right here, featured in the novel The Martian. Mark Watney drove through it and then decided that he was going to call it the Watney Triangle. So I really like identifying the Watney Triangle. And it's very helpful because it leads you right to Valles Marineris. This is the giant gash on the surface of Mars. It's so straight and so long, it really does look like some mega giant dragged a knife across the surface. So I think gash is a good word for it. When you look at this thing, though, it's more geologically, perhaps, like a split. Uh, if you are familiar with clay or ceramics, when something's hardening, if it has a little tiny crack in it, as the surface hardens and dries out, it can sometimes pull apart a little bit. And I think that's kind of a maybe mediocre analogy for what's going on here. When we look at this surface feature, we are seeing where the surface split long ago we think maybe in the process of forming continental plates, sort of the crust, the tectonic plates, I should say, that we enjoy here on planet Earth, but on Mars, they never quite completed. Now, because of that, we just have this giant feature across the surface. If we check it out, you can see just how massive this thing is. In the TV show, The Expanse, there are people who live on the sides of Valles Marineris. I think that sounds so cool. But just look at the surface of Mars from Ballas Marineris. This is such a beautiful, special thing. And we really do have amazing high resolution imagery of it. 
what we're seeing here is the kind of foggy sheen of that thin Martian atmosphere. So I'm going to peel that atmosphere away using one of my cool buttons. And that should give us, let's see, I think I can just go to atmosphere. Yeah, I don't have that button handy. I don't want to spend enough time to figure it out. So we can sometimes get rid of that atmosphere and you can really see the high res details on the surface. It's not a hard thing to do. It's just hard while you're doing it and people are watching you. But looking around on the surface of Mars, I saw Eagle asking, when do I think humans are going to go to Mars? I would bet relatively soon. Soon being like not next year, but I think in the next 10 to 20 years, we will probably get a human being to the surface of Mars. And I think that sounds absolutely awesome. The idea I would like to address and defeat, though, is that human beings are going to go to Mars. We're going to land there. We're going to turn it into a beautiful Earth-like paradise. All the humans are going to blast off. We're going to go live on Mars so we don't have to worry about Earth. Because I think that's kind of a, a dangerous idea. Earth is a very special planet. It is the most Earth-like planet human beings have ever discovered, ever, 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 and probably will likely ever discover because, heck, it's Earth. It's an important spot for us to take care of. And as much as I am excited about the possibility of humans becoming a multi-planet species, we can never forget where we came from. Earth is something really wonderful, really special. And I think astronomers around the globe would agree it is the most wonderful planet we've got and one we should definitely be studying as much as possible to understand and care for as much as we can. Angela and Thomas want to go see Olympus Mons before I fly away from Mars. I think that sounds like a lovely idea. Let me get us back down towards the surface and we can start moving in that direction. Right over here, we're going to start to see some big bumps on Mars. And those big bumps are the volcanoes of the Tharsis Plain. So even though I would have a hard time identifying Olympia, or excuse me, Utopia Planitia, this is an easy one to spot because it's got giant dark bumpy things on it. So what we're seeing is dark. It's not actually dark. What we're seeing are the shadows of these mega mountains cast onto the surface of Mars in what is known as an exceptionally cool thing. So let's change our time a little bit. I'm going to go, actually, I'm going to go forward in time a couple hours. And you can see now that those are not giant dark spots. Those are mountains. And if we go over here, these three mountains are huge to be sure, but they are dwarfed by this gigantic mountain. That's Olympus Mons. Okay, so when we dive down onto here, you can see some pretty exceptional details. This thing is so tall, it actually pokes out the majority of Mars's atmosphere, giving me one of my absolute favorite pieces of trivia. So if you were born on Mars, maybe one day in the future, when we have colonies on Mars, what would we call you? A Martian. A person on Mars is a Martian. When you go into space, we call you an astronaut. And if you were born on Mars and you'd never been in a spaceship, you might be a Martian who had never been an astronaut. But if you climb to the top of Olympus Mons, you would go above the majority of the planetary atmosphere of Mars. And that's our current operating definition for astronaut on Mars. So I would say that you would be an astronaut, even though you'd never been in a rocket ship. That is super cool. Traveling into space just by walking up the side of a mountain would be a pretty awesome thing. So I see some folks talking about variation in temperature. Owen wants to know what is my favorite part of Mars's landscape. I might lean towards the Watney Triangle, not because it's anything special or awesome, just it's got a cool name and a cool story. But actually, I've got a different answer. I'm going to fly us there in a second. Folks are looking up, looks like it's about four miles deep for the depth of the Valles Marineris. Now, that's pretty exceptional. We had a question about temperature. It ranges dramatically. Some parts of Mars are actually not that cold. They go for about, I think it's negative 20. And me being a California, that's in the Fahrenheit scale, pardon me. So me being a California, negative 20 sounds abysmal and horrible and humans can't possibly survive at that temperature. But I know my producer, Mary, is from Michigan. I know a lot of other people are from Michigan and apparently it can go below 20 in Michigan and human beings do just fine. So with proper equipment, the warm parts of Mars would be no challenge for human beings to hang out on. However, Mars does get a lot colder. So it does dive down significantly below freezing on the chilly parts of Mars. So I think that goes down to about, if I recall correctly, it was about negative 20 on the Celsius scale, which is a funny thing that it goes from negative 20 Fahrenheit to negative 20 Celsius, which is just a fun bit of trivia. 
Okay, so Mary says Michigan is mighty cold, and just fine might be overstating it. Apparently, even Michiganders don't like it being negative 20. I can definitely agree. That sounds pretty awful. I promised you another feature. So I'm gonna just going to fly us in here, and I've not plotted this out exactly. So this might be a little bit of wiggling on my part. But I think the areas just around Valles Marineris are absolutely fascinating. So let's see, that's the chaos end. If I go over here, there's these side areas of Valles Marineris. And I don't, I would love to give you the exact name of these features, but I didn't discover this because an expert told me, oh, go check out that site. This was from me just flying around on the surface of Mars. And in flying around, you get to see some really cool stuff. So I just loaded up our CTX, which should take a moment to come in, but these are strips of ultra high resolution images on the surface of Mars. And when they come in, there you go, it kind of looks like someone painted all these different regions. Well, if you dive in now, you get to see this amazing stuff all around the edges of Valles Marineris. And way down in some of these, you can see sand dunes, or at least things that look like sand dunes, that have all sorts of wonderful winding shapes. I don't think these are necessarily water features. They're probably more like wind features. But just seeing these weird sand dune shapes all over on the surface of another planet strikes me as something really wonderful and really special. So I would encourage all of you, if you think this kind of thing is cool, by all means, download open space, fly around and discover something that you've never seen described someplace else, and then go look it up if you feel like it, or else embrace the mystery and really enjoy the fact that we're looking at stuff on another planet, and that's really cool. So over here, I'm seeing more cracks than sand dunes. Like I said, this is something I can sometimes spot, but it's a little bit of a hit and miss, almost literally. I see some folks phoning in from Newfoundland and Wisconsin, and apparently Californians just really should not leave California because we'll turn it into popsicles if we travel too far away. I can accept that. We have a pretty nice state here, and oh boy, many of us are not well adapted for climates outside it. But speaking of climates well far away from California and even planet Earth, if there's another spot in the solar system that you think would be cool to check out, by all means throw it in the chat. I would be happy to take suggestions we spent a lot of time on Mars and the moon, so I think Saturn sounds like a wonderful trip. Let's head out to Saturn. Thank you for the suggestion, Eagle. Okay, so we are taking a very fast trip to Saturn. Getting out to Mars on a manned spacecraft is likely going to take at least six months. Going out to Saturn closer to about seven years. Now, that's a pretty fast rocket, too. Likely it would take longer if we were going at human safe speeds. Why can't we launch humans at the fastest possible speed? Humans don't like it. It would interfere with our metabolic processes. And if we go fast enough, could maybe interfere with our general health. Just not good. So folks want to check out Hannah and Layla want to see the rings of Saturn. Jessica wants to see those rings too. Great ideas. Those rings are beautiful. And I would say if you are unsatisfied with this beautiful depiction we have in open space and you really want to see them for yourselves, this is something you can spot with a medium-sized telescope. Maybe not a little tiny, like, four-inch telescope laying around in your garage. But if you have a telescope that you know pretty well, or maybe a neighbor or friend who has one, borrow it for the recommended amount of time to make sure you're not going to catch COVID from it. But then point it at Saturn, and you should be able to see some of these really cool ring features. And if you want to find out what planets are visible in the sky, where to look, and when to see them, Check out our broadcast tomorrow at 1.30 on Facebook for Morrison Planetarium, and you can actually check out with Bing Kwok, our assistant director to the stars, a really cool virtual tour of the night sky, where he's going to tell you all about the cool things that are happening in the sky above us, including where you might be able to spot a planet. Okay, so we wanted to see those rings, and I think this is the coolest view. So I'm going to see if I can get this trick shot lined up. Check it out. So if I go in to the equatorial region of Saturn, which is this middle light zone right here. And I get us lined up just right. These are hard things to do in open space. Oh, you got a preview. I messed it up. Let's try this. OK, so if I fly right back, you get a shot directly over the rings. I think that is such a cool look for Saturn. You can see just how impossibly thin those rings are. 
Some estimates put the thinnest regions as about a kilometer. That's really thin for something that would stretch from Earth to the moon. Some people say it's a little bit thicker than that. Many of the particles we've seen individually are probably about the size of a house or smaller, but we estimate there are ones down to the size of like a bread box or an old computer monitor, down to much smaller things. So there's no, I don't think, smaller size limit for particles in the rings of Saturn, because anytime you have two medium-sized ones bash into each other, it's probably going to make a lot of teeny tiny particles. Now, those particles might have issues being pushed around by the sun at those radii, the size of the particle itself. But I think there are still many tiny particles flying around the rings of Saturn. They are so reflective because they are made of ice, by and large. There are maybe some stone particles in there, but the vast majority should be ice. And that gives them that wonderful reflective quality to the point where they often are thought to be like glowing when you first look at them through a telescope. But really what you're seeing is sunlight bouncing off the rings of Saturn. But here's a cool idea. When you are seeing light from the rings of Saturn that originated at the sun, think about the geometry of that. The light from the sun had to travel through space for about an hour to hit the rings of Saturn. And then it had to take slightly less than an hour for it to bounce off those rings and come back to your eyeballs. So if you work that out, the light you're seeing left the sun like an hour and a half, maybe an hour and three quarters ago, depending on the alignment from Earth to Sun and Saturn, but that light's pretty old by the time it gets to your eyeball. And I think that is super cool. Requests for Titan. Twist my arm. I think Titan is amazing, so I'm always happy to go there. We are going to point our spaceship towards Titan and go check it out. Thankfully, not a far trip. Titan is pretty far from the rings. So it's many millions of miles away, I would guess, from Saturn itself. But for gas giants, that's not that big a deal. So out here you can see the surface of Titan. At least you can see radar images of the surface of Titan. There's a set of photos from the NASA webpage that's kind of a true color version of Titan that looks orange and green with little bits of purple shading in there. It's super cool looking. That's an idea of what the surface of Titan would look like through that incredibly thick nitrogen atmosphere. We are seeing radar images that cut through the atmosphere already to show us a reflecting versus non-reflecting map of the surface of Titan. So what you're seeing is dark is radar absorbing areas. That's areas that are probably rougher or bumpier where radar didn't bounce straight back up. The lighter areas are probably flatter and smoother. So that's where we see probably ooh, that looks like a crater or something on the surface of Titan. I have not noticed that before. Check this out. It looks like a double walled crater. Can you see that? So I'm going to see if I can point out the walls. There's an inner wall there and an outer wall here. And if that's a double wall crater, that's a big crater. I need to go look up craters on Titan because that is super cool. You can see it interrupting this dark area, which is probably one of the oceans or lakes we see on the surface of Titan, which is just so cool that there are lakes there. And by cool, I mean cold. And by cold, I mean it's probably like 300 degrees below zero on the Fahrenheit scale. So <clears throat> Wonder wants to know how you get true colors. I shouldn't have said true colors. I should have said translated colors because that's a guess at what a human eyeball would see on the surface of Titan based on our measurements of what the substances are made of, the amount of light that would get through the atmosphere, yada, yada, yada. When you add all those factors together, it's an imagined version of what we think the surface of Titan would look like to our eyes. What would it actually look like if you dropped a human on the surface of Titan? Not much because your eyeballs would probably start to freeze very quickly, and that sounds really bad. So this is a kind of idealized version of what a human-type camera might be able to see. But cameras probably wouldn't work there either, because it's really cold. A lot of human technology does not like working at temperatures that low. OK, Melissa wanted to see Europa. And I saw a question from Rob earlier. Am I using a space mouse for steering? No, I am using the second cheapest laser mouse that Amazon had to offer. So a lot of this stuff is very accessible for just the hardware you have. At the planetarium, we have some awesome control systems like multi-joystick flight with uh, velocity throttle control. But honestly, a keyboard and mouse, once you get used to it, works incredibly well. OK, I said Europa, right? Right. OK, Europa. Today we love cold moons and I am here for it. 
I love cold moons. Moons are so cool. When you talk about moons in our solar system, it's amazing to think just how many we have. If you add up all the moons of Saturn and Jupiter and the outer planets, we are talking about almost, I think, 200 moons. That's great, especially because we only got eight planets. Now, when you think about how many moons we know outside the solar system, that number is absolutely huge, right? Actually, it's zero. We know of not a single moon outside our solar system. Every moon we know about is in our solar system. Are there moons around other planets, around other stars? Man, there must be, but we have not found any evidence of them. And where there is no evidence, we must remain silent. We can speculate about their existence, but until we have some measurements, it remains a plausible idea, but one that we can't really say much scientifically about. So when we discover, and I will say when, because I think one day we will, a moon around another planet, around another star, we are opening up a whole new can of worms. We think there might be life on some of the moons in our solar system. Places like Europa certainly could prove hospitable. And we're going to go look for life there, we think, in the not too distant future. With the Europa Clipper mission, we are going to be I, basically trying to find the likeliest spots for a follow-up lander or swimmer mission that might go around inside Europa. But we are still kind of at that first level of speculating. We want to try and find the right spot for us to send our follow-up mission to look for life inside it. When you think about Europa and Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn, and Titan, the one we just visited, these are places that are hard to cross off our list of potentially being hospitable for life in some way. Now, that's really cool because they fall outside what's normally thought of as the Goldilocks zone, the distance from the sun you need to be for liquid water to exist on the surface of a planet with a similar size and pressure to Earth. That's a lot of caveats. But when we start thinking about the possibility of all these moons around other planets, around other stars, man, there could be so many opportunities for life to exist elsewhere in the universe, away from us, around another planet, around another star, that the opportunity really does become just, I think, one-to-one. -one. We are going to find life someplace else in the universe. We just haven't found it yet. Now, if you want to find out more about that, we're working on a really cool planetarium show all about that subject. And if you want to find out more, stay tuned. Okay, so we are backing off a little bit because I saw a couple extra galactic questions. Jessica, I love the comment that Crater makes Titan look like a huge Pokeball. I think if you compiled a list of just the right features, you really could get a nice Pokeball looking world. Some of them, like uh, if you look up the moon Mimas, I don't think we have a good texture loaded up. But Mimas or Mimas really looks like either a Pokeball or the Death Star, depending on which angle you view it at. Okay, so I see a ton of suggestions coming up. Mary, where should we go? I can abandon my searching out other worlds and other places idea. Okay, Pluto. Cool idea. Let's go see Pluto. Now, Pluto has some big craters, to be sure. It's got some very interesting smooth features. In fact, there's one hemisphere that's just smoother than the other. So there's another Pokeball idea. If you mapped one hemisphere that's the smooth side in white and the other side is red for bumpy, you'd get a pretty good Pokeball. But some of the work's already been done for us because there's sort of this hemispherical dichotomy on Pluto. Some parts are very light, some parts are very dark. Some parts are very bumpy, some parts are very smooth. So check this out. When we dive into Pluto, I want you to think about, this is always kind of a tough thing, but imagine if I had a 3D printed model of Pluto with perfect, accurate representations of the height of different features. Imagine holding that in your hand. Like if you were to plop this little Pluto off the computer screen and hold it in your hand and rub your thumb over the surface, what would it feel like? It's a little tough to tell from above. Cold, probably, because again, Pluto's a chilly world. But some parts, I bet, would feel relatively smooth. So over here, you got some little mountains, you got big plains, you got some smallish craters, but relatively smooth, right? Okay, well, let's head over here. And again, just imagine rubbing your finger across a ball shaped like this. Over here, it starts getting a lot bumpier. There's these long ridges. And then you get to these crazy mountains and these massive cracks. This part of Pluto is really showing some dynamic changes on the surface. Then you get to this weird wrinkly stuff. Now, these are likely ice mountains, not mountains covered in ice. 
These are mountains made of ice. This is where we think the surface of Pluto, the crust, really is water ice. Ice would be harder than rock out here. So when you're looking at these mountains, they were not formed like mountains here on Earth by rock bumping into rock and getting taller. These are mountains that are being carved out by the sun through a process we call sublimation. When light from the sun hits them, it energizes the particles, the particles turn into a gas and escape. And that we think contributes to the atmosphere of Pluto as well. So this would be the super bumpy stuff, but I'm gonna fly this way. Now, again, just that thumb idea, imagine rubbing your finger over this part of the surface of Pluto it would be impossibly smooth, like glass-like smooth. There's almost no change on the surface. This is that nitrogen glacier on the surface of Pluto. So what we're breathing is mostly nitrogen, the air of planet Earth. On Pluto, it is so chilly that the nitrogen is effectively frozen into that mush. It makes that very smooth, featureless region. So Pluto is amazing. I could spend way too long talking about it, but I think I have used up all of our time it is 5.01 in the California time zone. So I'm going to take us back towards planet Earth. But I would like to thank all of you for tuning in. We've had a wonderfully active chat. And to me, that is always just the coolest thing. If you have an idea for a place that we didn't get to, throw it in there. Or tune in next week and let us know. Because we are always taking more suggestions on cool places to visit. While the planetarium is closed, we are going to keep continuing to do this. Broadcasting from our homes to yours. Because this is a really fun, awesome way for us to engage with our audiences know that we miss you a ton. If you want to check out more about Open Space, download Open Space at theopenspaceproject.com. I see a bunch of folks have linked it in the chat. Go check it out. Let us know what you think and tune into the Open Space Network because there are lots of really cool programs happening. But from all of us at Morrison Planetarium and at Open Space, thank you for joining us here. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday, wherever that might be. And we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>